Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Dr. Veronica Garcia, Executive, Executive Director of New Mexico Voices for Children. Dr. Garcia served as New Mexico's first Cabinet Secretary of Education, where she advocated for early childhood education, school-based health clinics, breakfast in the schools, elementary physical education, and extended school year programs uh, like Kindergarten Plus. She served as superintendent of the Santa Fe Public Schools, and her work as Secretary of Education won her the National Governors Association Award for Excellence in State Government. It's an honor and a delight to have you here with us today, Dr. Garcia. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Voices for Children uh, released this September a policy agenda for a better New Mexico. It's a fascinating and open-minded uh, document with a broad social agenda. Um, it begins by saying uh, June 24th was a dark day in New Mexico. It was the day that the Anna E. Casey Foundation released their 2013 National Kids Count data book, which ranked New Mexico 50th in the nation for child well-being. Could you tell us what child well-being actually is? Well, the Annie Casey Foundation annually puts forth this Kids Count Report, and it gives a ranking as it ranks states 1 through 50 in child well-being. And um, what people don't realize is that this ranking is made up of four domains, okay. um, education, health, um, economic well-being, and family and community. And within each of those domains are four indicators that it measures um, child well-being or that what they believe contributes to child well-being. So it could be access to pre-K, um, children who are, have health insurance, uh, fourth grade reading scores, um, educational attainment levels of parents, um, children who are born, uh, say, to a, or, or live in single parent uh, families. And so they look at the various issues that they feel contribute to, to child well-being or child student success. And um, so these 16 indicators make that up. Uh -huh. And so New Mexico is ranked in each one, and then you get an aggregate uh, ranking. And New Mexico fell to 50th, and um, it is a dark day. But I also think that we can take advantage of that because it's brought a lot of attention right. to the plight of New Mexico's children right, right. who are really struggling and living in poverty. In the realm of, e of economic well-being, let's say, um, uh, Voices for Children uh, see raising the minimum wage, increasing uh, working families' tax credits, uh, uh, protecting food stamps, uh, um, I increasing low-energy income assistance uh, programs. They see that kind of thing as being uh, important to, uh, to childhood development and, and childhood education and simply the happiness of, of young people. Could you expand on that kind of social view of, of, of children's health? Well, you know, we know that children whose families are living in poverty are experiencing tremendous toxic stress. Oh, no. And um, when families are struggling to make ends meet, when children are facing food insecurity, which yeah. is a nice political way of saying they're hungry, yeah. it's very difficult for them to focus in school, um, to come to school, as we say, ready to learn. Uh, poor nutrition uh, affects brain development. When parents are struggling to pay bills, um, if they're putting more of their money into taxes, that's why the earned income tax credit is important. Um, you know, we have a very regressive tax system in New Mexico where the poor pay a disproportionate amount of taxes. So all of these pieces come together to support the economic well-being of families, a minimum wage. Um, you know, there's just been such a, an outcry of, you know, why this is so bad for business, yet um, folks in this income bracket typically do not save but have necessities and things that they buy that then circulates back into the economy. Sure. And so it, it just makes such a tremendous difference. 
um, in the lives of these families if we can provide these sorts of economic supports. We have such a disproportionate number of working poor in our state. I don't know if you're aware that New Mexico ranks number one in income inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, we're number one or, or I think at number two in poverty. One of the things I really admire about Voices for Children is they get the fact that education and child well-being is a systemic issue. It's about the whole nature of our culture. And so children who are, who are, who are basically victims of a kind of rapacious and, and exploitive economy uh, suffer terribly and uh, cannot possibly do as well. Uh, unless they are you know, uh, blessed with, as many are, with wonderful parents who make make sure that they succeed. But most people who are, you know, holding down two or three jobs, I mean, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, so I think this is, a, I don't know, my judgment, I think it's exactly the right way to go, and I always have. Um, when it comes to education, uh, uh, you advocate for such things as passing a constitutional amendment to support early childhood uh, learning programs with a small percentage of income generated from the land-grant permanent fund. Uh, I think this is incredibly important. Could you expand on that a little bit and, and say why it's important? Well, investments in you know, early learning is key. And, and why is that? Well, the brain science tells us that the most you know, activity in terms of um, brain development in children uh, happens in the first five years. And it, uh, it is amazing all of the neural connections that are met, the architecture of the brain, so to speak. And how that develops so quickly, we need to take advantage of those first five years. Mm -hmm. We also know that children who live in poverty, um, and it's not only children in poverty, but it's exacerbated by poverty, that there may be domestic violence in the home or drug abuse or alcoholism, homelessness, divorce, uh, single parent families, all of these issues that create a lot of what is toxic stress and often referred to as um, adverse childhood events um, affect brain development. So why early learning? Um, uh, we just passed a Home Visitation Accountability Act. We need funding for that act. We need uh, funding to invest in home visitation programs. And what that does is to assist um, mothers pr primarily, but fathers too, in terms of um, teaching them simply about child development, how to interact with their child, to recognize, like some people believe that, oh, a baby doesn't know what's going on or a baby's not really learning. You know, they're basically eating and sleeping. And, and it's like, no, they're, the children are learning from, you know, Beginning. Right at the beginning. Yeah. And so how they interact with that baby and how they can soothe the baby and create less stress for the baby, um, ensure that the baby has proper nutrition. And, and factors like, um, say, uh, uh, maternal depression, postpartum depression, oh, yeah. you know, that could have a significant impact on the development of the child. Having someone come into the home, be able to connect that mom to social services or the supports that they need. Uh, we know that sometimes when, when moms are suffering, um, you know, postpartum depression or are under tremendous amount of stress can increase the incidence of child abuse yeah. or if there is alcoholism or domestic violence. So to provide interventions early, to provide support to this family is going to ensure that this child is going to get the supports they need so that they aren't suffering the toxic stress. Child care. You know, child care is more than just babysitting. And we want to have quality child care programs so that as a child is learning and building this brain architecture, they're getting quality care. Child care uh, programs were first thought of as a babysitting and a way to allow moms and, and dads to be able to work and have someone care for the baby and care for the baby in a safe environment. And a safe nurturing environment is key, but also an environment that is stimulating and helping build that architecture. And then, of course, pre-K falls into this 
span right. of early learning and right. care. Right. Yeah. And you know, we have the long-term PERI studies as well as others that show that children who are in pre-K are less likely to be incarcerated, less likely to drop out of high school, yeah. more likely to graduate. The early uh, studies here in New Mexico show that they are performing um, you know, better than their peer group yeah. in terms of third grade reading and so on, which we know is a linchpin, so to speak, you know, or maybe not a linchpin, but more of a, a, a benchmark yeah. that if you're reading by third grade, you're more likely to graduate from high school and do well in school. So the investment in these early years is important. Why the land grant permanent fund? We have, I believe, the second largest land grant permanent fund yeah. in the country. We are sitting on, you know, millions and millions of dollars. We're not talking, as some people like to say, raiding the fund or that we're going to deteriorate the corpus of the fund and we're not going to be saving for future generations. I think that we are being penny wise and pound foolish uh, in our approach to the land grant permanent fund. The constitutional amendment has in it um, the, the language, the, the um, to, as a safeguard that if the fund ever dropped, I think it's below maybe, I forget if we get it more than 8%, don't quote me yeah, on, yeah. on the figure, yeah. but if it gets to a certain point, it just stops. So it has you know that safety valve built right. in it. Yes, it um, I think where some of the arguments come is that, is this education? Well, I think we need to think back of how education has progressed through from the beginning when our when this fund was set up kindergarten for example was not part of considered the educational system and we have kindergarten and funds have gone to to fund kindergarten programs and i think as our learning has advanced about what education is i think it makes perfect sense to take a small portion of these dollars to help fund um early childhood education, which I believe begins with as early as home visitation programs all the way through, um, to not use those resources that we so desperately need. And I, we can tell you that the need outstrips even what the percentage of funding that we would get from that, but it will help take some pressure off uh, the general fund for these programs. And so um, what we're asking is for... Um, our legislature to pass uh, a House Senate joint resolution to allow New Mexicans to decide. Um, the polling that we've seen show that New Mexicans believe that investment in early childhood education is vastly important. Parents want it for their children. Sure. Parents want it for their grandchildren. Uh, you know, we all know that those early investments are going to make a difference. And it's been held up by political maneuvering. We got it through the House uh, floor last year, but we could not get a, a hearing um, in Senate finance. And we believe that legislators, they're elected to make tough decisions. They're not elected to, perfect, to protect committee members from having to make tough choices. They're elected um, to make decisions and to act on policy. And so what we say is vote it up or down. Uh, and but but more importantly, let's vote for it and let's let New Mexicans decide <laughs> because it would be on the ballot um, in 2014. And that is, if anybody gets anything from this, um, watching this program, is to contact their legislators and to contact the Senate Finance Committee and let them know that they want New Mexicans, they want the opportunity to have voice and to decide um, of to allow us to tap into the land grant permanent fund to fund this very important program, which we believe is a high leverage program. We'll save money later in special education, remediation, remediation, uh, other social services that are needed. Um, it, it's again, uh, I have to go back to saying it's, you know, penny wise and pound foolish. Yeah. I think, you know, anybody who's a parent knows that, Education begins, you know, like almost the first second. And, uh, you know, how do children get um, to become polylingual? Uh, they learn early, exactly. very, very early. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is really, really important. And I know the Mercury is going to support this as much as it can. Awesome. And um, we wish you the best with it and all of us the best with it. Um, I've always been sort of strange, uh, strangely perplexed by... 
the the uh, strange condition of of uh, Medicaid for children and how the enrollments are are in the um, in the outreach uh, to getting children into the program is uh, seems to be a little difficult and and even made that way by what's the and I know your um, uh, your policy initiative wants to make sure that the Medicaid plays a greater part in the life of, uh, in the lives of young people. Could you explain that a little bit uh, because then. I think a lot of us would like to understand more. Getting children enrolled in Medicaid uh, is, is extremely important. Nine percent of our children in New Mexico are not covered. And um, this isn't a legislative fix, but more, I believe, um, the Human Services Department really meeting the spirit of the law and uh, not just the letter of the law. And I think it involves political will as well uh -huh. uh, to do the right thing for our children. Um, it, again, it's another one of those situations where having children have access to health care is so key from, baby, you know, well baby checkups uh, to immunizations um, to screening for developmental disabilities or developmental delays so that children can get the intervention early because the earlier they get the intervention, the less likely they're going to need intensive care later, uh, more expensive care. Uh, more expensive special education services. So the early we can intervene, the better. And I'll give you an example. Let's just say a child that has chronic um, otitis media, which are middle ear infections. You say, well, it's not such a big deal. They're crying and whatever. Well, it is a big deal because the longer a child has an ear infection, they are missing uh, in, in critical developmental period a, a lot of sounds. Mm -hmm. This child is more likely mm -hmm. to have learning disabilities, to have reading problems. Um, that translates to special education services, uh, a greater potential if you're not reading by third grade to drop out of school. So you can see how just having an untreated ear infection can make a significant difference. Um, I've heard Dr. Shi talk about you know kids who are staying up uh, and missing work because the baby is sick. Uh, then they miss work. Pretty soon you know they're out of a job. So then we've exacerbated the cycle of poverty. Um, we have children who are citizens who are born to immigrant parents whose parents may be afraid to access services. Yeah. And we need the Human Services Department to take a more uh, assertive role in getting out in communities enrolling children to make it um, more understandable in terms of providing information in Spanish and really doing the outreach to get children enrolled. Um, we believe that under the Affordable Care Act, you know, if people do show up at uh, an emergency room that they'll be enrolled, but we really want to see very active um, active um, strategies to uh, get these children enrolled. It's, it's, it's extremely important. And again, it saves dollars in the long run. Sure. Uh, you know, preventative care makes such a, uh, an important difference, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, these early developmental stages, if a child has a speech delay, any number of things, yeah. this early intervention is going to make a tremendous difference and be a cost savings as well. In the area of family and community, uh, your policies, uh, uh, your policy solutions include uh, to restore eligibility for child care assistance at twice the poverty level, uh, and also expanding the funding for adult basic education and English as a second language. I find that a really interesting uh, a series of things. Um, obviously, a child's uh, the child's well-being depends on the well-being of their parents. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, and in the whole realm of community and family development. So you know, we can't take a child out of context, right? They right. live in a, in a family with a, you know, their parents and um, their economic situation affects the children, obviously. And so, uh, for example, child care assistance. We have a large percentage of New Mexicans that we call working poor. Sure. You know, they're holding do down jobs, but they're, they're just barely squeaking by. And at 138% of poverty, um, it, it becomes very, very difficult. I think for one person, it's like an income of 15000 a year. Yeah, so you figure 
what that would mean in terms of, you know, you can barely get an apartment for seven or $800 a month. And you think of other expenses and then we expect them to work and we want the children to be in a safe environment. And so even at 138% of poverty, I think it would be difficult because there'd be a lot of many, many parents that aren't gonna qualify. You know, I don't know if, if your viewers are aware that childcare costs more than, you know, college tuition. You know, we, we, we say, you know, gotta save up for college. Well, child care, you know, I mean, babies that just happen, you haven't had a whole lot of time to save, and now you're in a situation that you want your child to have quality child care, as we talked earlier, but we also want them to be able to work. Adult um, basic education is really key. Um, I believe tw about around 20 to 21 percent of New Mexicans, or at least, it, you know, ch children live in head of household that do not have a high school diploma. Educational attainment levels of the parents, and sorry, primarily women, the moms, is the best predictor of a student's uh, educational attainment level or a child's educational attainment level. So it's key to get adults, for a couple of reasons, probably more than a couple, to go back to school, either adult basic ed, GED, associate's degree, and so on. Uh, one, it communicates volumes to their children that education is important, serves as tremendous role modeling, but also it's tied to their um, income, right? The, the higher level of, of education, um, you're going to be able to uh, bring home a better salary, uh, less stress about paying the bills, again, less toxic stress in the family, and this whole thing just continues to cycle. Um, being able to have opportunities for ESL, English as a Second Language, is very key. You know, the language of commerce in, in this state is English. Yeah. And so having that support, we know that we don't believe that being bilingual by any means is a deficit. Uh -huh. We know that uh, children's cognitive development increases when they know two languages. And so we think it, it's a plus. And so uh, we want to give... Um, Spanish speakers the opportunity to um, be able to be, um, um, you know, capable in English because it opens more doors of opportunities for them and makes life just a little bit easier. The Voices for Children viewpoint is a broad, systemic viewpoint, uh, which I think is, is soundly reality-based from my perspective. Um, I, we all know that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of families the majority of families who work hard, who do everything they possibly can for their children. Uh, the decks are stacked against many people, uh, and, and uh, it's not it's not hard to imagine because many of us have been there ourselves at one time or, or another in our lives to understand how incredibly difficult it is to do everything right, you know, particularly when you're working 40 hours or 80 hours a week. What do you... What do you personally, and what does uh, Voices for Children consider to be the, <coughs> excuse me, the um, uh, uh, the major one or two things that New Mexico could do uh, to improve the lives of their of their uh, troubled children? So as we look at you know one or two things that we think are key, before I get down to maybe discrete programs, yeah, yeah. but at a thirty thousand foot view, our investments in education and health, and we need to have the um, enough revenue to be able to support those programs. And the approach and, and investments in health and education will lead to uh, a stronger economy and really our engines for economic development. The strategy since about 2003 in New Mexico has been to build the economy by uh, corp you know, providing corporate tax cuts. Yeah. And uh, we can see that it is a failed economic policy. Um, it didn't necessarily create more jobs. Uh, we just exported 400 jobs because we didn't have an educated workforce. Companies are going to locate in New Mexico, and this really is a case of build it and they will come, if we have an educated and healthy workforce. Singapore is an amazing example of that. 35 years ago, their gross domestic product um, was three and a half times less than it is today. And their focus was on education and health. Yes. And our focus primarily has been on tourism, which creates um, low wage jobs. Yes. And so um, we need to, to really focus on that 
and we need to have enough revenue to pay for those programs, specifically within education. I would say that the primary thing is investments in early learning and care when that brain uh, architecture is being built. If we can intervene early, then we can save a tremendous amount of money later in terms of, you know, dropout prevention, special education, you know, um, remedial services, uh, you know, dealing with drug abuse. I could go on and on of all the social ills that come from not having a good start. So if we want to look at the most high leverage kind of uh, investment that we can make, the best, the, if we want to talk business terms, the best return on investment is investing in early learning and care. Um, and of course we have to have health. If a child is access to health care, if a child is not healthy, you know, we didn't even get into the issue of dental health, oh, yeah. but so many children do not have access to dental health. Right. And so um, they wind up, you know, coming to school with a toothache or they're hungry or, you know, all of these issues that, that impact children. But, um, Again, I would say early learning and care, the constitutional amendment is a great opportunity for us to be able to provide a, a strong infusion of dollars, sustainable amount of dollars in, in an area that we know will make the, bo the, the most difference. Um, but if we want to turn this picture around, we as New Mexicans are going to have to decide that children are important and that we really want to break this cycle of poverty for New Mexico. And I think we have the, it's in our hands and our, you know, I think we, we have the ability to do it. It's just having the courage to make the tough decisions. I'm sure that virtually every viewer of the New Mexico Mercury is concerned with these issues uh, and, uh, and believes uh, that children in any culture, and including our own, matter really above almost all else. Um, what can, what series of things can we do as as uh, as progressive New Mexicans, if you will. What are the kinds of things that we can do seriously to help? I would encourage your viewers to go to our website, www.NewMexicoVoicesForChildren, okay. and to um, download this policy agenda, okay. to look at the areas that they feel passionate about, to look at those indicators and to think how their work may align with this, how their passions align with this. Perhaps they have other ideas for policies that would make a difference. And, you know, contact their policymakers or legislators about these issues, uh, I think is really important. Um, get involved by writing letters to the editor ar around these issues that they believe it's important. Um, if they feel like we do, that uh, investments in early learning and care are important, um, that um, they, you know, email, call um, the legislature. They'll be in session in January. And even now, I mean, these interim committees are meeting. Right, right. And they do listen to phone calls and emails and letters to say, you know, let New Mexicans decide. Let New Mexicans decide on that ballot initiative to be able to tap into the land grant permanent fund to to help us have the resources we need to fund early learning and care. But go through this. If your passion is teen pregnancy, let's say, or teen pregnancy prevention, or maybe it is early childhood, um, look and see what, you know, it, maybe you're on a board that could adopt a co couple of these policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you, we were sort of joking about, you know, join voices, yeah. but we are 95% um, grant funded. Um, we are having to move to become a more sustainable organization. We're constantly doing fund development. So donations, uh, being members, and if you can't contribute, then, you know, contact us and be a part of our e-voices uh, list because oh, yeah. you get um, action alerts as we're working on these various policy measures. Um, we are going to be um, starting an initiative where people can be co-citizen sponsors of some of these policy initiatives. Wonderful. And so you can sign on as a citizen co-sponsor. So you'll be looking at our website for that. But we need all the support we can get. Um, both moral support, you know, activist types of supports by, you know, um, talking to people about these issues um, because New Mexico kids are counting on us. Um, if it's not us, I don't know who. And I think that sometimes we feel passionately about something, but we say, oh, you know, my voice won't make a difference. You really do make a difference. And that phone call, that conversation in the grocery line, um, 
with somebody, you know, um, maybe it's a church, maybe it's at a club, maybe it's at the health club, it's a grocery store. Um, letting folks know that there's a lot that we can do to change New Mexico's 50th ranking and overall improve the quality of life for all of us. That was just inspiring. It was, it was, it was so intelligent and made things so clear. And it is a very clear issue, really. I mean, it may seem more complicated than it is, but it is ah. very clear. Uh, and uh, I know probably many people from, from the New Mexico Mercury will, will follow your suggestions. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was really an honor and a joy. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for having me here and for giving me this opportunity to be able to share this policy agenda that we believe is an agenda for a better New Mexico and to giving this voice. Um, uh, we can't thank you enough, and thank you for supporting us. We appreciate it very much, and thanks for the great questions. It was a pleasure being here.